Hi, I'm Jackie Tantillo, and this is Should Have Listened to My Mother. Before we get started, I just want to give another big shout out to all of my listeners. Thank you for your continuous support over the years. And Should Have Listened to My Mother is building our audience week by week and year after year. We have listeners not only in the U.S., but in Europe, U.K., Canada, India, Japan, Saudi Arabia, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and more. And it's just incredible, this common thread of, of talking about our moms, lessons learned, and how we all can be connected. It's pretty great. So a big personal shout out to anybody and everybody who is listening all over the world. And you can always email me if you have stories you'd like to share at shltmm podcast at gmail.com. Again, like should have listened to my mother, shltmm podcast at gmail.com. And be sure to tell a friend about us and any chance you get to give Should Have Listened to My Mother five stars and some feedback. We'd really appreciate it. Janine Kim is my guest this week. And in just a minute, she's going to share her stories regarding her mothers and how her journey of finding and loving her true self began long ago, but she didn't quite understand it or recognize it. Life sometimes leads us onto these crazy obstacle courses in order for us to find our true self. It's important to take our experiences with us, acknowledge them, and learn from them. A little bit more about Janine Kim. She's an intuitive healer. She says she was born that way. Janine is an astrologer, medium, holistic health practitioner, teacher, writer, and she calls herself a spiritual sommelier. Janine and I have two things in common that I know of, and that is Dr. Norman Vincent Peale's book, The Power of Positive Thinking, and a love of Van Morrison's music. She's passionate about bringing people peace and alignment with themselves. Also, Janine Kim has a workshop in March of 2024, so we have lots and lots to talk about. Hello, Janine, and welcome to Should Have Listened to My Mother. Hi there, Jackie. Thank you so much for having me. I love the the whole concept of this podcast, so I'm grateful to be here. Thank you. And uh, we were chatting briefly before we started the interview, and when I try and find guests for this show, I I don't always know if they have a particular relationship with their mom, as I say, good, bad, or indifferent, but I'm drawn in and I do a lot of research to find out what kind of person they are and what their journey has been. And it just so happens that Janine has a, a lot to share with us today. So I mentioned earlier that you have two moms. How about if we start there? You you have a biological mom and an adoptive mom. I do. I absolutely do. And the story that I have uh, with the adopted mother, I know so many people nowadays have kind of like that multiple mother situation, but mine begins back in 1967 where, you know, back then if a woman became pregnant out of wedlock, it was frowned upon. So my biological mother had to hide away in a home for unwed mothers and kind of sit in what that meant for her. And then, of course, once she gave birth to me, then she had to give me up. It just it was just the way it was for them back then. And coming from a strict Catholic upbringing, my grandfather would have it no other way. So uh, they sent me off to the cradle, which is a beautiful place in Chicago, still there today in Evanston. And back in the day, they kind of held the babies back for a while to make sure they were on track and everything was okay before they went to their families. And there was quite a few of us, you know, quite a few of us back then. So, um, yeah, I was there for a while and then I went home to my um, my adoptive mother, and I was raised mm. with her. So, so yeah. your your biological mom's name is Ellen. You mentioned earlier to me, right? Right. Yes. And your adoptive mom's name is Carol. Okay. And are they both with us still today? They are. They okay. both are. Wowie kazowie. So, okay, you are adopted. Yes. 
And did they have any other children, the couple that adopted you, or were you their first? Yes, I was her first. I was my my mother and father who raised me. I was their first. And then they had, uh, they adopted one other after me, uh, my brother, John, and then they had two more after that. And my mother who adopted me, they had tried for years, my parents, and they lost quite a few babies, sadly, and which is what led them to adoption. But then once she had us, out came my other brothers. So so I was ah. raised, in, I was the oldest girl with three younger brothers, one whom is adopted as well, but we are not biologically related. Okay. So for simplicity, you referred to your adoptive mom and dad as your parents. Yes. Okay. Just so we know. So you grew up in Michigan? In Chicago, south side of Chicago. Close, very close. Mm -hmm. It was a normal, happy childhood until things started getting kind of funky. Is that how we yeah. <laughs> That's kind you know, of isn't, that, to the chase? isn't that how it goes? <laughs> Life happens, right? It, well, it was. It was, you know, my, my parents brought for me an amazing home, a uh, roof over my head, food in the belly, nice clothes, all of those things. And and yet, you know, the the trauma of what they had to incur, again, remembering the context of the time, no support, you know, <laughs> when you go through the, the traumas mentally, emotionally, physically, uh, spiritually. And so that built up over time and it kind of collided in my teens. Even before that, there was there was just a lot of um, of difference there. And I come in with my own wounds. You know, when you're adopted, there's a whole bunch of feelings about yourself that, you know, back then especially, if you had no place to put it, couldn't articulate it, it could brew inside of you in a certain way. But as years went by, it just became really rough. My mother who raised me, we Carol, we we clashed and she had a lot of grief and sadness within her uh, and some challenges, you know, physical, mental health challenges that were just not being met. And so it was like, you know, it just kind of dumped over onto me and and a bit of the rest of the family as well. And so, you know, one of the main, I was really thinking long and hard about kind of condensing down what my mother should have said and or you know what i take from that for the for your show today and i often say that mother is mantra mantra is something that we habitually repeat whether it's in our mind or in our nervous system or in our body and what i extracted from both my mothers actually but the main the main outside one is the mother who raised me is you are only good enough if you dot 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 that was that was what I heard intuitively, empathically, emotionally, physically, and even verbally at times. You're only good enough if you dot dot dot. And so that's those are the messages I received from both of my mothers. Say you had only been there their one child, right? Right. Could it have been drastically different had she just had you and or your your brother? Was it the biological siblings that came along that changed thing or her mental imbalance and well-being? Or I don't know if that's a question you can even answer. Hey, that's a, such a good question. And, you know, when I feel into that, you know, of course, things could have been different. But a lot of the, the butting of the heads that we had and the hardships that we had had a lot to do with um, her own unresolved stuff. And I could only imagine the trauma that she had trying to have children for 10 years and losing quite a few children and even her take on what a woman was. So who knows who's to say there wasn't, you know, a big disparity between my my biological brothers being treated any more different than myself and my adopted brother. Ah, there was some inklings of that there, but that wasn't the overarching theme. It was really about trauma. Her trauma, right? Oh, God, right. So her trauma. Yeah, drastically sad, emotional, hormonal, and mental. You know, trauma. Right. Um, ah. Okay, so but that doesn't justify some of the things. Give us a little bit of the detail of some of the things that she made you do. 
I'll put it that way. Right. Hey, well, I'm going to I'm just going to go straight to the big one. There was yep. quite a few <laughs> along the way, but I'm going to give you the goods cuz here we are and I pray that this story helps as well. So you're only good enough if you dot, 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 right? Mm -hmm. And so there was so much about me twisting and turning who I was just to please her, just to kind of draw her in in a different way where I would get reflected back to me that I was good enough in any way. And so hit the patch of my teens. And mind you, this is the 80s. You know, we have all the movie stars and supermodels out there. But it was so much about my looks, and so I, you know, I didn't look good enough. I didn't act right. And I became bulimic. Now, of course, it's how I also internalized things. But the, the, the amount of pressure and hardship, you know, the words, the mental abuse was so tricky for me. I would hear things all the time like, you know, girls are so bad. You are so fake. You don't know how to love anybody. Like this was just nonstop. These are your mother's words. My mother's words, my mother who raised me, yeah, those were her words. And there was so much more to unpack there around that, but every move I made was based around that I just wasn't good enough. And so when I did have the bulimia, she panicked and she would say, you know, you're, lo you're gaining weight, let's go to, um, you know, um, Weight Watchers was around at the time and they had like these little stickers you would put on their, <laughs> in their books and I was so embarrassed to go there. And I would like instead go to my best friend's house and we'd steam the sticker off like her mom would let us steam it off her Weight Watchers book and to put it on mine so I wouldn't get grounded or in trouble for not going. But then wow. ultimately she brought me to plastic surgery in the in the 80s. And it was a time where this wasn't a thing at all. And she hid it from my father. She hid it from my brothers. And she would wasn't talking to me, wasn't talking to me, and I agreed to do this. And then she'd pick me up from work with the, or from school rather, and we would drive to that doctor's office in Oak Brook, fancy place, and, and she'd make me food, she'd wrap the foil, she'd be kind, she'd, like all the goodness was coming because I was following her lead. This was what, after the procedure? Good enough. This was before. This oh, was like, yay, you're going to do this. Setting and, the trap, luring you in. Yes. Oh, my God, you poor baby. I'm sorry. Yeah. This, and was, this is happening today. This is still happening today. I know. I'm so sorry. Okay. So she's luring you in. You're looking for appreciation and acceptance, and she's doing exactly what you think is love and it's not wasn't right and yet there i was getting the the attention the accolades the affirmations um feeling somewhat of a sense of value i remember being in the room and i don't know where she got the money to do this because you know I, I i don't know i don't know if i was like a free experiment for them like all these doctors and the students in their white coats were there and there i am it's gonna you know in my underwear a 16 17 year old girl just standing there being observed by these people being said how fat i was in certain areas and then you know what they were going to do for the liposuction which was pretty intense back in the 80s and so that's what happened and i went through with the surgery and um why did the doctor even approve of this? Well, right? This is, <laughs> oh as a God. mother, I'm a mother. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, it's, it's the, um, what are the value, what's the value system meaning? And even my biological mother, you know, I met her on a whim because usually all, you know, documents are sealed and closed. But I, I found her, I sought, I sought her out, and she was, same dilemma full-on depression. We could get into her a little later, but the main takeaway I receive from her as well is that, you know, in order to be accepted, you have to be sexualized in a certain way. You have to look a certain way. Your value is in the external. It's not in what you bring internally in any way at all. 
And these men, you know, and, and I and I love men. Believe me, I have nine younger brothers. I have two sons. I, like, I love my men. <laughs> but at the time, even in the ethos, you know, in the in in the whole um, zeitgeist, so much of it. And even today, it's very much mm-hmm. about what you bring physically for their for the sake of their consumption. And I just don't get it. You know, this this led me to where I am today. But back then, I suffered through it, and I lived through it, and I had the surgery. And you left home very early. You went on your own. You said, "I'm not doing this anymore. I'm right. out of here." Mm-hmm. But something in your gut had to, let alone the emotional verbal abuse, the Holy Spirit. I would say, if one is religious, was talking to you, or the gods were saying something to you. Your intuitive awareness was talking to you. Oh, completely. And I, I just, I knew I had to go, didn't know where, had nothing. Like I had a box of plates from Kmart and my, you know, my waterbed, which I didn't even like that again, my mother bought for me because she thought it was so cool, but I hated it right. because it'd throw my back out. But anyway, so I, I left with that, the two things and I just started working and I, and I had to find my way, but because mother is mantra, there is an imprint that we receive whether it's mentally or energetically or just the way we feel life to be. And both of my mothers mothered from a place of depletion, like utter depletion and lack of awareness around self. And so I carried that blueprint with me. And even though I was free physically from what was happening, I would recreate the scenarios, you know, with bad relationships, um, you know, I didn't know how to value myself at all. And I, you know, maybe dated a couple guys a little too long because their grandmas were so good to me or their mothers or, you know, something. Well, you're like looking for nourish. love and maybe the, the wrong places. All oh. the wrong places. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's complicated. You, you think you left the house and you could whoop, flip a dime and, and be on your merry way. But this is a repetitive emotions, repetitive behavior that you continue. So tell us a little bit about your biological mom, because I I believe that she had a terrible time with the whole experience of having to abandon her baby. How old was she when she had you? She was 21 when she had me, and uh, 20, 21, and she had a terrible time. Again, 1966, 1967, you know, Catholic, uh, south side of Chicago upbringing, uh, father and mother, mother was Irish, and she um, was the only child, so very much focused upon and frowned upon that she got pregnant. And she dated my father for a while, got pregnant. He wanted nothing to do with it. So my grandfather sent her away. And, you know, they couldn't even, this home for unwed mothers, they couldn't even go out during the day. They had to go out for their walks to the lakefront, you know, Lake Michigan at night uh, when they couldn't be seen. And so they stayed there. And sure enough, when she went to give birth to me, they put her in a room, they're like, oh, she's giving this baby up. And she had to deliver me by herself because nobody came to help her. No and so finally, way. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Is this place still open? No. Well, you're ready for this. It's Edgewater Hospital in Chicago, which Hillary Clinton was born there. And so was John Wayne Gacy. And then, you know, I mean, apparently this oh. this this hospital had some history. I was born there as well. But, you know, this is this is how, I don't know, this is how they did it back then. And they literally shoved her in a room and said, oh, it'll take a while. And they left her there. And Oh, my gosh. What do you say to that? It's just not right. But your mom is a survivor. I hope she knows that. She's got strength in her that maybe she doesn't really understand. <sighs> I love that you say that. It kind of brings tears to my eyes a little. She is a survivor. She she is. And yet, when I came out and the nurses walked in, they said, you're not supposed to see this. And they, they scolded her um, because she did it on her own. And then when she, they stuck her in a room for all of nursing mothers and the nuns would come and say, don't worry, you'll have another like that someday when she went looking for me. And so then no, no counseling, no therapy. She just went on with her life. That's how it was. And, um, but then she went off and had five boys. <laughs> and every, every time she gave birth, there was really no ultrasound when she did this. So every time the boy came out, 
she's, I mean, she's loves her children now. I've met her, you know, and I, I've spoken to her. She loves those boys, but she, she said she thought God was punishing her for giving me up. So this has affected her life massively. And to this day, even when we're together, there's parts of her that she just can't see me. You know, she'll get really sad and say they gave, they took her away from me. And I'm like right there. So I know that it's compartmentalized for safety, for survival, just like you said. But again, you know, her road after that was trying to find value in herself. And, you know, it's again, that inner wound that we all take with us as that we imbibe from our mothers. That is our story to kind of step over the threshold and move forward with in a different way and a different wisdom if we can. Right. She probably had to work so hard to forget. She couldn't talk to anyone probably about having this baby, right? Absolutely. She had no. to go. She, I mean, what did she say when she came back? I mean, the lies that she had to tell, the, and she had to just swallow all of this and keep it in. I can't imagine she even, her parents asked her about it. No, not allowed Never to be Never talked about. about. So that alone has long-lasting effect. Um, so a shout out to Ellen. Yes. Love She's amazing. And as are you, you've both come a long way. I'm so grateful that we got to talk about all of this, your mom and your mother. And I know Carol did what she did, but um, nothing can change that. How is she today? Are you in touch with her? Um, I'm not in touch with Carol, um, sadly. I mean, I'm... If she needs me, I'm always there for her. Right. And um, but uh, daily stuff, I can't. I can't. I just can't do. How about your siblings? Oh yes, I'm. I'm in touch with my siblings that I was raised with, and my biological mother is so sweet as well. I, I chat with them, but it's you know, it's not a whole whole thing. No. Yeah. And that's okay. Right. You know. Yeah. Yeah. At least you know who she is and where she is, and. And you know the story, you know the backstory. I so love it. And, oh. you know, both of these women gave me the path that I'm on. And so now I, you know, I, I help people find their own value of self from the inside out. So, that, I mean, it's like I, I chose the perfect storyline to direct me to a really great place of understanding for my clients and my children. Like, I'm, you know, mm -hmm. I know how to be a mother to them, yeah, in a different way. So You've mentioned mother is mantra. Can you explain that a little bit more? Because there may be some people that don't understand what that means. Absolutely. Mother is such a sacred space that we hold. And, you know, we've all have a mother. And whether you're a man or a woman, you know, you have that principle within you. Because mother, you know, we, we are steeped in the belly of our mothers. And that I, I'm a firm believer that everything is energy first. You know, it is how I do my work, how I live as a being. And so when you're in that system, you steep in the belly. Or when you're raised, you know, by a mother, that environment, the mother is the nourishment. It is the first home. It is... Um, how you get met emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually, or not. And so, you know, mantra, mantras are like the mala beads that the monks have, or if you do the rosary, you know, each bead, you, you repeat, you repeat, you repeat. And so, the mother energy steeps into our bones, into our nervous system, into our minds and our hearts. And even though the mothers may be gone, whether by death and we're sad or, you know, uh, we leave them or, you know, we're taken from them, whichever way, all of the above, they are still like repeating in our systems. And so when we come to learn that, we come to understand what that means for us, then we could, you know, take a moment and say, well, what can I do with this feeling that mother is, the feeling, not just the words, but the feeling that mother is. Hmm. Powerful stuff, Janine. <laughs> it's pretty great. And that's Yay. just a tip of the iceberg. So your website, I want to make sure we get this out before we run out of time. Janine Kim, and Janine is spelled J-E-A-N-N-I-N-E. 
and Kim as in someone's first name, Kim, JanineKim.com. You have podcasts that you do. You are on YouTube, Spotify, Facebook, Instagram. If you want to hear and see more of Janine Kim, just go to JanineKim.com. And in the couple of minutes we have left, I know you have in March of 2024, you have a whole conference coming up, a whole workshop. I do. Thank you so much for saying so. Yes, it's in Santa Fe, New Mexico, March 8th, 9th, and 10th, and uh, in person only. Uh, no virtual there, but I'm working with Dr. Jeffrey Tarrant, PhD, and he is, uh, we call it the scientist and the psychic combo. <clears throat> and what he works on is he scans my brain. And so when I get into intuitive readings, when I get into meditation or healing mode, past life work, mediumship, you name it, he has scanned my brain and he shows how different our brains are, us a psychic people, which I truly believe we are all psychic. And, and he shows that to us. And then I show how we can all get there. It's just a place within ourselves. And so it's like coming home back to ourself again. It's that, you know, going back within as the mother is. So that's going to be in March and you could sign up on my website and it'll be wonderful. So much healing and learning and practicing of intuition. Yeah. Pretty great. And also on Facebook and Instagram, I believe it's the mystic dot Janine yes. Kim, right? The mystic dot Janine Kim. Well, I, uh, I, again, I can't thank you enough. And I, and I'm so glad that we connected. This is brilliant. And I, been enjoying listening to your podcasts and your astrological information, which usually is pretty overwhelming to me about Leo's moon and this one, yeah. and you're honest that. Exactly. Yes, I know. <laughs> but there's so much to learn, and I'm so glad that you have committed to it's not my story anymore. I think that's one of the takeaways that I got from listening. You don't have to live in the past. None of us have to live in our past, and that's not who we have to be. No, I see it as this is the recipe that we get to do whatever we want with. And it isn't just about the words, but the feeling of it, you know, getting right and aligned and true with ourselves. And yeah, it isn't our story anymore. So how will we be with it? And I love that one, too. So thanks for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. Janine Kim, thank you so much for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Me as well. Thanks for having me. And thank you so much, everybody, as well, for inviting me in. Thank you. People all over the world sharing stories about their mom. Very, very impressive. We'll be back next week with another episode of Should I've Listened to My Mother. <laughs>